Brothers and sisters and friends, I am thrilled to be with you this morning. Uh, I wish I were actually with you and could feel what I always feel when I'm with groups of young adults. It so happens that just a few weeks ago I was with a group of young adults in Northern California and, uh, and another one in Southern California and I will picture them as I talk to you. I'm grateful for this privilege. I pray the Spirit will be with me and will prompt me. I also pray that the Spirit will be with you. And if you haven't already, as we launch into this magnificent conference, if you haven't already invited, even pleaded with the Spirit to come and talk to you, then I invite you to do that. Every one of you are in a different phase and stage and uh, episode of life. You're trying to figure out things, you're worrying about things, you're trying to sort through things, you're trying to get answers to specific questions. And it's the spirit, not me as the speaker, but it's the spirit that can relay to you and translate for you what you need to hear. The spirit is the true teacher. The spirit is always the teacher. And so I invite you to invite the presence of the Holy Ghost to be with you. Now, <clears throat> as we launch this conference, I'd like to invite you to think about a couple of principles that I hope you'll think about throughout the duration of the conference and going forward. The first principle, let me illustrate the story. A couple of summers ago, I was invited to participate in a young adult regional event up in Toronto. It was going to be a quick trip for me because of other circumstances. I was going to fly to Toronto on Saturday morning, participate in several events on Sunday, and then catch the first flight out on Monday morning. Well, as Friday progressed, I was hit with a problem at work that was pretty substantial. And I started trying to solve the problem, but it not only did I not solve it, but it was getting worse as the day progressed. And I was just absolutely becoming traumatized about the notion of leaving town. I felt like I ought to be in Salt Lake City trying to address this problem over the weekend rather than making this trip, but I had made, committed to this trip months and months before. And so I thought, okay, I'll be all right. I kept trying to console myself, but about the middle of the evening on Friday evening, as things had not gotten better throughout the course of the day on this particular issue, I thought, boy, I've just got to tell them, too bad, so sad, I can't come. So I fired off an email. I couldn't get hold of the guy in charge, and I knew he was already embroiled in the early activities of this conference. So I fired off an email to him and said, I feel sick about this. I'm horrified about it, but I've had a problem that's arised that has arisen in Salt Lake City, and I've got to take care of it and I can't come. And then I even gave him a couple suggestions on someone who could fill in for me. Well, pretty late that evening, so now it's Friday night, it's approaching midnight, and I get an email back from him saying, if we could change your schedule around on Sunday and get you out earlier so that you could be back to Salt Lake first thing Monday, would you consider trying that? I told him I would, that I'd get on the phone and see what I could arrange. So, about midnight, I'm on the phone with Delta. Not my favorite activity, actually, sitting online with Delta. And I get this operator and tell her my problem, that I'm scheduled to fly home from Toronto on such and such a time on Monday, but could she possibly get me on earlier flights on Sunday evening? And she, you know, I can hear, I can hear her doing her computer thing, and she's looking up things, and she comes back and basically says, well, it doesn't look promising. I'm going to talk to my supervisor, blah, 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 and she puts me on hold. And I'm on hold, and I'm on hold, and I'm on hold, and I'm on hold, and, and she's not coming back. And after about eight or nine minutes, which eight or nine minutes on hold feels like forever on hold. And I will confess that my personality probably wasn't ever set up to be on hold. I don't do well on hold. But it finally dawns on me, Sherry, you've got another phone in the house. I was talking to her on my landline, so I picked up my cell phone, and I dialed Delta again and got another agent. And I said, I'm on hold with another Delta agent. I've been on hold for quite a while. I really need some help with something. I'm going to hang up this other one if you'll promise not to put me on hold. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I said, no problem. Just can I ask you my question? So I hung up the other one. Now I'm talking to a new agent. I start all over to explain the problem. And she says, just a second. And she immediately says, I'm not putting you on hold. And I can hear her going to the computer and checking some things. And she said, she came back in like 40 seconds and said, it's all taken care of. I said, seriously? 
She said, yes, it's, it's all taken care of. And I said, well, how can that be? Because this other girl said there are all these problems and whatever. And I said, how can that be? And she said, well, it's all taken care of. And I said, well, that's fantastic. What's the change fee? I said, it's OK. I'm not worried about it. I just would like to know what it is before my credit card gets dinged for it. And she said, <clears throat> it's all taken care of. I think, are you kidding? I've changed a billion flights on Delta. I always pay a change fee. So I questioned her about it again. And she said, there's this big, long pause. And she said, Sister Do, it's all been taken care of. You ever been called Sister Do by the agent at Delta? Well, I mean, you wouldn't have been called Sister Do, but you know what I mean. And I said, do I know you? She said, you don't know me, but you know my father. I said, who's your father and how do I know him? And she said, he has told us for years and years and years that you helped him with a project a number of years ago. And when I heard his name, I said to her, well, actually, the reverse is true. He's the one who helped me with a major project. She said, that's not the way he's told it. He's told it that you helped him. And she said, when I saw your name come up and your frequent flyer number, I grabbed the phone because I thought maybe this was a chance to help someone who had helped my father. She said, Sister Do, it's all taken care of. And it was. The flights worked beautifully. I went to Toronto. As it turned out, I did need to be there that weekend. It was facilitated. I mean, what are the chances that it would be facilitated by a Delta agent who happened to feel like, for some reason, she had a connection to me and wanted to help? Hope she didn't lose her job. Hope she didn't do something she shouldn't have done to help me because she did what the other agent had said wasn't possible. Now, I look at that and I think, that's not even possible, but it happened. And as it turned out, I did need to go to Toronto. I needed to be there for reasons perhaps for some others, but for sure for some reasons for me. In that moment, <clears throat> I needed to fulfill that assignment and the way opened up to fulfill it. I thought about the Delta miracle a lot. I thought about that unusual unfolding of events and I think it teaches a principle and that is this, and it's principle number one that I invite you to think about. God knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows exactly and precisely what your mission on this earth is. And he knows exactly and precisely what you need in the moment to fulfill that mission. God knows who you are, where you are, what your mission is, and what you need to fulfill that mission. It's pretty important to understand because you've been sent here to have influence. We have all been sent here to have influence. And particularly... As latter-day sons and daughters of God, we've been sent here to have righteous influence. I don't know how many thousand of you in California will be participating in this conference, but let's say it's 10,000. Let's say that each of you will have direct influence on 1,000 people in your life, and I've only picked a round number, and it's a small number. You'll probably have influence on many, many times more than that. Let's say it's only 1,000, though. 10,000 times 1,000 means that you will walk out, if I've done the math right, and influence over the course of your lives 10 million people for righteousness if you're able to do what you came here to do. God knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what your mission is and what you need to accomplish that mission. First principle. The second principle I want to illustrate simply by quoting three statements from three of our leaders. In the 70s, Elder LeGrand Richards, who was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, gave an address at BYU that he entitled... I am much more interested in the long hereafter than in the brief present. I'm much more interested in the long hereafter than the brief present. I've thought about that a lot, about how hard it is in the scope of everyday life to be more interested in what's going to come down the road, even eternally, than right here, what's in front of us and facing us and the things we're feeling right now. I wish I had, I wish I had more dates. I do. I wish I could find someone to marry. I do. I wish I weren't alone. I wish I knew more to what to do with my life. All those things are right in front of us. It's hard not to see past though, to be able to see past those and to focus on the long hereafter. So that's the first statement. Second is statement actually came from a prayer that Elder Michael Ringwood gave in a prayer at General Conference a couple of General Conferences ago. It caught my attention because he began the prayer to the Saturday afternoon session by saying these words. 
Heavenly Father, we are grateful that so much is required of us. I remember thinking, wow, am I grateful that so much is required of me? The next afternoon, Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles began his address on Sunday afternoon by saying, Heavenly Father is a God of high expectations. When you take those three statements together, we're grateful that so much is required of us because it is, that God is a God of high expectations for us, and when you couch it all in, can we be more interested in the long hereafter, meaning eternity, than in what's right in front of us today? When we think of all those things together, it leads me to another principle I invite you to think about, which is life actually isn't about this life. It's very important. It's crucially important. But life isn't about now. It's not about this life. It's about what comes next. Now, when you think about those two things as we talk about the theme of the conference, which is taken from President Uchtdorf's talk from the, May, uh, from the uh, October 2008 General Conference, where he spoke in priesthood session to the topic of lift where you stand. He tells the story of being in their Darmstadt, Germany uh, chapel and needing to move the grand piano into the cultural hall for an event that was going to be held. And all these men get around the grand piano, and they keep trying all these different ways and shifting and trying to figure out how to get that done, and, and it's not working until one of the brethren says, Brethren, just stand close together and lift where you stand. And President Uchtdorf goes on then to give a magnificent address about what it means to lift where we're standing. And to me, it's part of lifting, doing the heavy lifting and shouldering the burden that Heavenly Father needs us to shoulder as latter-day sons and, God, uh, and daughters of God to do and to fulfill our mission that we've been sent here to earth to do and to fulfill. So how do you and I stand close together and lift where we stand in our lives today and in the world today? The world we live in is really complex. It's really engaging and it's very interesting, and it's also complex. I invite you to think about, against the background of those overriding principles, three things. If I wanted to um, try to wreck your lives, if I had the assignment to say, how would you absolutely make sure that there isn't a single young adult that would come and fulfill their mission on this earth, what would you do? Now, that isn't my goal. My goal is to do just the opposite. My goal is to say, is to help and to mentor and to help you feel like you absolutely know you can do what you came here to do. But if my assignment were to do the opposite, what would I do? I think there are three things I would do to try to get you off track. I'd make sure you never learned who you were. I'd make sure you never learned who the Savior was. And I'd make sure you never learned how to get revelation. Now, and I think if I could do those three things, I can keep you from fulfilling your mission on this earth. I think I can help you botch your life. But the flip is also true. If you know who you are, if you know who the Savior is and what he's already done for you, and therefore what he's poised to do to help you now, and if you know how to get guidance from home, direct from our Father, through the ministering of the Holy Ghost, if you can do those three things, you can do what you came here to do. You absolutely can, and you will. We don't have time to go into great detail about each, so I'm going to take just a couple of minutes on each one to give you something to think about, and I hope to pursue on your own. Number one, who are you? We've been singing, I'm a child of God since we were in primary. Young women stand up and repeat, I'm a daughter of Heavenly Father who loves us and we love him every week in, in young women's class. We've been hearing about who we are and our identity forever, but do you believe it and do you know it? I can tell you that how you feel about how God feels about you will completely flavor and guide the way you handle your lives. I watched a few years ago, I happened to catch a, a story of a Marine lieutenant, a female who had been very highly decorated for bravery. And this interviewer kept trying to get her to explain why she had been so brave. And she told him and gave him answers and he kept pushing her. And after about the fourth time of saying, but how did you do what you did? How did you demonstrate such bravery under fire? She said, look, I'm a Marine. And that's what Marines do. We're brave when we need to be brave. 
We need to be that convicted to our identity as sons of God, daughters of God, sent to live in the latter part of the latter days and what that means. President George Q. Cannon said, our father held in reserve his most noble sons and daughters. He held in reserve those who would have the courage and the determination to face the world and all the powers of the evil one and yet be fearless in building Zion. Do you see yourself that way? I invite you to undertake a little bit of, a, an, of a, an effort to find out how Heavenly Father feels about you. You might start by reading section 138 and Abraham chapter 3 and asking Heavenly Father if those verses about the noble and great ones have anything to do with you. Because when you know, when you start to feel how God feels about you, it will plant in your heart such a determination to do what he's sent here to do. That's number one, finding out who you are. Number two, finding out what the Savior did. I was in my early 30s and thought I was getting married. And then through a really painful set of sudden circumstances, I didn't get married. The circumstances involved so many things that were painful and sad and heart, hard and heartbreaking that I was devastated. When I look back on that time, though, I'm grateful for what proved to be a year or so of deep, deep pain because it drove me to the scriptures, it drove me to them. And one day I noticed a verse in the fourth chapter of Luke, I think it's verse 18, where the Savior says that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And he says, I have come to heal the brokenhearted. I have come to heal them that are bruised. And I, wow, that just grabbed me because I felt brokenhearted and bruised and just absolutely beat up emotionally and spiritually. It led me to explore and to say, I don't think I understand the atonement. I don't think I understand that it's for more than being forgiven of sin. In the years that have ensued, I have come to see the atonement as a doctrine of healing. Heal us from sin if we'll repent. Heal us from our mistakes. Heal us from heartbreaking, heartbreaking situations. Heal us from weakness, Jacob 12, 27. If you don't know what the Savior has already done for you and what he'll do for you now, I plead with you to pour through the scriptures to find out what he will do and how he will strengthen you, heal you, and enable you to do things you can never do on your own. Number three, getting messages from home from our Heavenly Father from heaven. When I was in my early 20s, I needed to make a tough, tough life decision, and I had prayed and fasted, and I couldn't for the life of me understand what the Lord was telling me. So I asked a dear friend of mine to, if he would give me a blessing, and he said he would, kind of an older brother, mentor, friend. And as we were talking before this blessing, he said, well, what is Heavenly Father telling you? And I said, I can't tell. I can't tell. I can't tell if I'm making up things in my head or if I'm getting revelation. And he asked me a question that changed my prayer life and it changed my scripture life. And he said, have you ever asked Heavenly Father to teach you what it feels like for you, what it sounds like to you when he's trying to talk to you? And I said, well, I, no, I don't think I have. And he said, you ought to ask him to teach you. That very night I began to ask him, the Lord, to tutor me, that I could learn to hear the language of the Spirit. The language of the Spirit is a language, just like Chinese is a language, or Portuguese, or English, if that's your second language. You have to learn the vocabulary. You have to learn the grammar. You have to practice and practice and practice. All the, all the rules that govern the language of Revelation are right here in these holy, sacred books. That's one of the reasons to be regularly immersed in the Scriptures, because we get Revelation that way. I still can't always just get an answer like this by any means, but sometimes I can. And when I can hear, I can hear. It's clear, and I know what Heavenly Father is telling me. I've been working on it 30 plus years. But I plead with you to begin to learn the language of Revelation, and it starts here. Start with Doctrine and Covenants 121, where the Lord says, nothing will be withheld in our day and that there's no chance that the Lord can be 
prohibited or kept from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. I testify to you that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I testify you're not facing anything right now that Heavenly Father didn't know you were going to face. I testify that if you can have a long-range view rather than a short-term view, it will change the complexion and scope of your life. I testify to you that God is our Father, that Jesus is the Christ, that they are filled with power, and that their power is evident in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in the covenants we make, through the ordinances we participate in. I testify that there is power in the atonement to heal you and strengthen you if you learn how to go before the Lord and ask for it. I testify that the minute you know who you are, that it will change the way you frame and look at your life. And I testify that no one wants to talk to you more than your Heavenly Father does. If you will learn how to talk His language. As you learn to do each of these things and focus on each of these things, you will absolutely be able to lift where you're standing and to do what Heavenly Father has sent you here to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.